So thanks for joining today, everyone. Today we have a special edition of the Inbound Capital webinar series where we're going to be talking about Craig Wright's upcoming legal court cases and what that means for the broader blockchain world, uh, Inbound Capital portfolio companies, and how Inbound Capital intends to uh, speculate on the trial in a dedicated vehicle. Unlike the vast majority of our webinars, we'll actually just going to be if you're listening to this now in a recording, the for the public version, we kind of are going to cut it off before the Q&A and before I talk about the trade strategy. Uh, if you're you know, listening live and want to share this with other people, just please ask me in advance for permission and to who you're sharing it with. And if you're listening to this and want to hear the full recording live, you could just email me at uh, Zach, Z-A-C-H, at unboundedcapital.com uh, to request access to the full webinar. Uh, but to get things started, we're going to talk with our resident Craig Wright court case expert amongst the embedded capital partners, Dave Mullenmore. So Dave, please take it away. Thanks, Zach. One thing on the sharing front, do you want the AI note takers in here for the full thing? Just something to be mindful of. Yes. Um, I appreciate everyone here that I actually know does read their own AI notes regularly, but yes, I will be kicking them out at that time. Uh, this was not a thing we had to really think about six months ago. <laughs> All right. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, like Zach said, we're going to be talking about Craig Wright's court cases, but not really for Craig Wright per se, but really how it matters for Bitcoin's legal precedent. And then there's also, like Zach mentioned, a trade structured around it, which is relevant. So there's a lot of Craig Wright court cases. We're going to just cover kind of some of them. Uh, still, it's going to be a lot. Um, and yeah, let's jump into it. So for the purposes of this webinar, there's really three categories of lawsuits. Um, the first are the ownership cases, asking you know what rights does Satoshi have over Bitcoin? There's the passing off cases, with the core question being which version of Bitcoin is the true original Bitcoin? There's the fiduciary duty cases, which is asking what duties, if any at all, do blockchain developers kind of across the board, but for Bitcoin in particular, owe to owners of their projects tokens. And then there's one, you know, really like tight question, uh, which will be answered in a preliminary single issue trial, which I'll explain what that is later, which is very directly is Craig Wright, Satoshi Nakamoto, the inventor of Bitcoin. So I'll try to keep it relatively brief. We'll go over, uh, Kind of the details of the, these lawsuits that are in these four categories talk about some of the ramifications and then zach will end with the trade structure one disclaimer uh, i'm not a lawyer so this is a layman reading kind of everything that's available in the public docket and summarizing um and this is all very high level so i'm gonna we could you know do a webinar kind of on each case um so i'm just gonna go super high level and then in the q a feel free to uh ask questions and we can hone in on the specific cases. So the ownership cases, like I said, the core question is what rights does Satoshi have over Bitcoin? These cases are broken up into three component parts. So there's the copyright on the Bitcoin white paper, the founding document of Bitcoin, the copyright on the Bitcoin file format, which is more technical, but very important. And then something that's unique to the European Union and the UK, which is a concept called database rights over the database that is the collection of Bitcoin transactions. Uh, there's various cases that fall into this category. Craig Wright is a plaintiff and defendant across the various cases. And this is a little snippet from one of these cases um, saying Dr. Wright's case is that the copyrights and the database rights, which he with the other claimants, which is uh, Tulip Trading and other Craig Wright entities, own, provide a mechanism by which you can prevent the further operation of the BTC blockchain and the BCA blockchain without his consent. The most straightforward of the ownership cases is definitely the copyright on the white paper. So this is just, did Craig write the Bitcoin white paper? If he did, then he has copyright protection on the document. That's pretty unobjectionable, pretty clearly defined. Um, this is the focus of the COPA case. So COPA is seeking a declaration that Craig is not Satoshi Nakamoto. He did not write the Bitcoin white paper. Um, and it's just, you know, squarely over this document that was written in 2008, 
This is relevant because a few years ago, Craig began to exercise his claimed rights by requesting that companies that are hosting the Bitcoin white paper remove it or use a new version, which is all the same, except it credits Craig Wright by name rather than Satoshi Nakamoto. So you already saw a few prominent organizations, namely BitcoinCore.org, remove the white paper after Craig requested that. And then Bitcoin.org did the same in the UK, which is where they were served. Um, the copyright on the white paper is relevant for that simple reason of, are you hosting the Bitcoin white paper? Well, you need my permission to do so if I'm the copyright holder. But it's also may become more relevant because the white paper is hosted on all major versions of the Bitcoin network because it was put into block 230,009, which is on all three networks. The Bitcoin file format is less straightforward. People aren't thinking typically about copyright applying to programs or you know non books or you know more like literary uh, works. So the question here is is the organization of the data itself in the Bitcoin block a copyrightable literary work? If you look, you know, there's been news recently on this on Twitter and social media. Most people kind of just laugh this off. Um, they say like, this is so ridiculous. How can this be a literary work? But it actually is pretty clear that it is literary work. So if you look at the Copyright Designs and Patents Act of 1988, what is encompassed in literary work does explicitly include things that, you know, in layman's terms, you wouldn't call literary work. So things like tables, computer programs, and databases. So this initially when Craig brought this was thrown out. So the copyright on the white paper was able to go to trial and the copyright in the Bitcoin file format was denied because it was not a serious issue to be tried, according to the judge, which is a legal threshold you need in order to serve people out of jurisdiction. That was overturned unanimously by the three appellate judges a few weeks ago. So now the white paper copyright and the Bitcoin file format copyright will both uh, go to trial. The third and probably the most important is the database rights, rights question. So database rights are a special kind of as if copyright protection, which applies specifically to databases or just assortments of facts or data. And the important part is that this is a right that extends even when the individual data are not copyrighted works. So for example, you can't copyright a fact, you know, Paris is in France is not a copyrightable work. But if it's organized in a certain way in a database uh, that meets certain criteria, the database itself can be owned and protected by database rights, which are very similar to copyrights. Uh, so there was an example relatively recently, a British company had a database of geospatial coordinates of British residences, and they were determined to be infringing on the database rights of the Royal Mail and a few other claimants even though you know, the individual data of this residence has these coordinates is not copyrightable uh, work. The threshold for determining if you have database rights, I mean, this is obviously a very high level overview, but the core thing is that it requires a significant investment in obtaining, verifying, or presenting the contents of the database, not necessarily in creating the data itself, but just purposing the data into the database. An investment, is defined as any investment, whether financial, human, or technical resources. Uh, and the database right provides the database rights holder with the ability to, quote, prevent extraction and or re reutilization of the whole or a substantial part of the contents of the database. So functionally operates very similarly to a copyright, but over a database specifically. So if Craig is able to successfully argue that he has database right over the Bitcoin database, which is his claim in the case, that would extend to BTC, BCH, or any other fork which utilizes a, a substantial part of the database, which since it's identical up until the point of them forking, um, seems relatively straightforward to argue. So Craig has several avenues to being successful in arguing that he has rights over the use of Bitcoin at large, uh, both for the copyright, on the file format and also the database rights. And there's kind of a decision tree where Craig, you know, and this is kind of me looking at the different cases and trying to suss out what Craig's legal strategy is. But it seems like there's like a plan A, plan B, plan C template where if he wins the Bitcoin file format copyright, 
that would make the Bitcoin database a collection of copyrighted works, right? Each block is copyrighted as Craig's file format. If it's a database of original works, then he has copyright over the database. It's called an original database. And then he would have protection. He could, you know, restrict use of it. And this restriction of use would also extend to indirect infringement. So even companies like Coinbase or Kraken, who are defendants in various cases, um, referencing these databases, uh, substantial parts of them could be restricted. But let's say Craig doesn't win on that leg of the ownership cases. There's still this question of database rights. So even if the file format's not copyrightable, Craig could still say, you know, this database is uh, subject to database rights, just like the example I, I listed before, where the individual pieces aren't copyrighted, but as a collection, it is copyrighted. So if that's the case, you know, same outcome as earlier. He has rights to control Bitcoin and forks. Uh, or maybe he loses both, and then there's no database rights over Bitcoin and forks. If that is the case, there's still kind of this plan C where he can win on what's called the Computer Misuse Act. So this is, an, again, a British legal precedent, but you have the right. There's instances where even in circumstances where the individual rights aren't copyrighted, thus it's not an original database, and you don't have database rights for whatever reason, you don't have a substantial investment, uh, like I said, uh, you can still restrict access to the database outside of contractual arrangements. So there's a recent case, I think it was 2015, with Ryanair, the uh, budget airline in Ireland, restricting access to their collection of flight data, which screen scrapers were using to aggregate, you know, websites like Expedia and Travelocity. Uh, it was determined that they this information wasn't copyrighted. They didn't have a database right on this flight information, but they were still able to enforce their contractual obligations, you know, licensing through um, checkbox, I accept the terms of this website uh, via the Computer Misuse Act. So kind of even in the scenario where Craig loses on kind of the core arguments here, there still is a potential outcome where he could have the rights to control Bitcoin and the forks effectively. The next type of case is the fiduciary duty case. The core question here is what duties, if any, do blockchain developers owe to owners of the project's tokens? Uh, the gist of this case is Craig is seeking proactive assistance from developers to help him regain access to stolen Bitcoin, which was the result of a hack of his home network in 2021. So the argument here is the developers of blockchain networks are able to reassign coins to a new address that Craig has access to and enforce property rights. So even in the event of a theft where he's no longer able to access coins, which he still legally owns, there's a duty for the developers to assist with that. So this would be a, a very transformative ruling uh, were he to win, not you know directly for like the is Craig's Toshi question, but it would have major implications over how blockchain networks operate and uh, particularly with the use of blockchain for crime or you know stealing coins. Um, that would be, there'd be a huge impact on how the law deals with those things. If you're interested in that topic of like how this would technically work, I wrote a article, I think last year now, Zach can uh, post that in the chat. Um, so Craig is the plaintiff in all these cases via his tulip trading entity. So it's Craig versus the BTC developers, the BCH developers, BCH, ABC, and also Bitcoin SV. This, similarly to the prior case, was also thrown out for failing the serious issue to be tried test. So he was un unable to serve defendants out of jurisdiction. That also was overturned unanimously on appeal. That ruling in the appeal is very interesting. Uh, but in the conclusion, the judge kind of sums it up very nicely that the question in this case is if the decentralized governance of Bitcoin is a myth, as Craig argues or if it's legitimate as the BTC developers would argue. So this is a very important case, I think, for just determining, you know, what is the role of decentralization and what are the, the obligations of developers of 
so-called decentralized networks. The passing off case uh, or cases, the core question there is which version of Bitcoin is the true original Bitcoin? Passing off is a British legal concept, um, which is deliberately or unintentionally presenting goods or services as those belonging to another party, often damaging the goodwill of a person or business, causing financial or reputational damage. Uh, so Craig's argument here is BSV is the original Bitcoin, uh, X, Y, and Z parties are representing BTC as the original Bitcoin, thus they're passing off um, BSV, claiming to be what BSV has the rightful claim to. Uh, there's various parties in these cases, uh, including not blockchain developers themselves, but also exchanges that are representing the BTC ticker as Bitcoin. So this includes Kraken, Coinbase, and others. Uh, Craig is the plaintiff in all these cases. And this was delayed until after the COPA trial over Craig's claim to the copyright on the Bitcoin white paper, which is scheduled for January of this next year. What's probably the most relevant trial for what Zach's going to touch on shortly is the single issue trial. Um, British law allows, this is actually a very efficient thing. I don't know if there's an analog in US law, but British law allows, if there's a common issue that's shared among several pending trials, that one issue can be tried in its own single trial. And then everyone just agrees ahead of time to be bound by the outcome of that trial. So in uh, a lot of these cases, in the ownership cases for sure, but also in the passing off case, there's this core question of, is Craig Wright Satoshi and thus is BSV the original Bitcoin? So that question framed that way is Craig Wright, Satoshi Nakamoto, the inventor of Bitcoin, is up for a single issue trial, probably. So there's, there's two ways that this will be decided. Either it'll be a single issue trial, which will have its own date, and it'll happen with all these various parties pooling resources um, and arguing that question. And if that is the case, the trial date there is still TBD. What could also happen is basically everyone just piggybacks on top of the COPA trial and agrees, let, let's let COPA argue this question since it's core to the white paper copyright question. And then we'll all be bound by the COPA trial. So COPA is set for January 15th, 2024. I asked Craig if there was like any chance that that would be delayed. He said, in you know, typical Craig fashion, like hell no, basically that's happening on that date. Um, so I would say if there was a single issue trial, it'd probably be before January 15th. So in December or January, uh, this December or next January, we should have an answer definitively on is Craig Wright's Toshi Nakamoto. And I would say since this question is so core to kind of the whole legal strategy, which I anticipate, you know, all these cases and appeals and kind of, there's even other cases that I haven't mentioned. That's like a five, 10 year project. So this really is the core question for most all of them. Um, so I think, you know, I'm confident that whatever Craig has, he's going to bring to this trial. Um, so it should be very interesting. We'll see in December or, or possibly January of next year.